This is London, one of the largest and most successful cities on Earth. Wow. Its story spans 2,000 years of daring invasions, catastrophic fire, heroic ambition, and astonishing technological transformations. From the Romans to the Tudors, from the Vikings to the Victorians. For years, this was the capital of the world, ruling over an empire of billions. So how did London rise up from an uninhabitable marshland to become the thriving 21st century city we see today? In this series, we'll reveal the crucial events that changed the very shape and size of London. I'll be digging down into the latest research to uncover conflict, betrayal and power politics. I'll be getting special access to some of the city's most extraordinary sites. And I'll be exploring the innovation and engineering brilliance that gave rise to London's most famous landmarks. So join us as we go on an amazing journey. Absolutely brilliant. To discover exactly how this incredible city was created. So far on our journey to map the capital's 2,000 year history, we've seen it grow from a swampy marshland to a great Roman city from a divided center of power to a congested capital that was struggling to cope. The stench of the Thames had become unbearable. In this final chapter, we arrive at the mid-Victorian era and we'll reveal how London grew to become a colossal city, unrivaled in power and influence. How it endured two of the world's most terrible wars and how one of the boldest engineering projects in London's history, Crossrail, will propel the city into the future. In 1801, there were just over a million people living in London. Yet, within a single generation, that number had tripled to just over three million. And that is an extraordinary statistic. Just imagine if the population of London today tripled in just 60 years. This is Victorian London. It's set to become the greatest and largest city on Earth. By the middle of the 19th century, with the arrival of railways, roads and sanitation, the capital had transformed beyond recognition. Mid-Victorian London was a force to be reckoned with. By 1860, its boundaries had extended to the open fields of Middlesex in the north and Surrey in the south. This rich and prosperous capital drew people here in their millions and, as a result, it was bursting at the seams. Just like today, London's roads would have been packed full of commuters. But believe it or not, in the 1860s, the congestion was a lot worse than today. In 1860, 13 and a half million people traveled by train to London Bridge Station alone. But major stations like this had been built on the outskirts of the city. So the only way all those people could get to their offices, stores and workshops in central London was by using its chronically congested streets. But in 1863, those clever Victorians came up with a solution to ease congestion on the streets. An incredible innovation that would transform the shape of London, the underground. And the Metropolitan Line is where it all started. I'm in what was part of the original underground service through the capital. And passing through here were steam engines belching out smoke carrying gas-lit, open-air carriages. In 1863, the Metropolitan Line opened as the world's first underground railway, with seven stations connecting Paddington to Farringdon Street. In its first year, it carried 9.5 million passengers, and in its second, a staggering 12 million. 
But this underground wasn't exactly underground at all. Stations like this were built using what's called cut and cover construction, which meant that the lines ran just beneath the surface. Effectively, they dig a big trench, lay the track, and then pop a roof back over the top. So we're not deep down here at all. But building these trains in drains was impossible without causing a huge amount of disruption on the streets above. And that was a problem. What was needed was a way of digging underground tunnels without causing so much damage. The inventive Victorians came up with the answer. Grab a torch, you can see everything. Abandoned under Moorgate Station is a revolutionary piece of equipment, and taking me to see it is TfL engineer Omar Mohammed. This is it. Yep, right head shield. When you compare this to kind of modern day tunnel boring Absolutely. machines, the technology involved yeah. in that, this might look quite simple, but it did the same thing just in Victorian times. Exactly, it's the same principle used today. The Great Head Shield was the tunnelling machine pioneered by the Brunel family. Each miner would dig out the earth from their chamber. The shield could then be propelled forward with jacks and a cast iron lining put in its place to form the tunnel. And, so, and these aren't the original cast iron Yes, lines, exactly, yeah, yeah. It's free, isn't it? Yeah. Hundreds of years old, yeah. yeah. And they're still doing the job today. Yeah. The Great Hedge Shield is responsible for the first section of what we now call the Northern Line, the first proper tube line that was built by boring a tunnel rather than cutting a trench and putting a roof over the top. By 1890, five tube lines transported millions across the city. In just under 30 years, with their world's first underground system, the Victorians had utterly changed London. By the end of the 19th century, London had solved the problem of easing congestion on its streets by building the underground. But it wasn't just about creating the tube. By the late 19th century, London had undergone the most intense period of construction in its history and it was well on its way to becoming a modern city. But there was a price to pay for the creation of this new London. Building it involved the demolition of a huge number of homes, which in turn contributed to a housing crisis that had become increasingly desperate. As more roads and railway lines were built, thousands of Londoners were forced out into already overcrowded areas on the edge of the city, like the East End. By the late 1880s, places like Shoreditch and Whitechapel were crammed with people living in desperate conditions. Here, the old nickel had become London's most notorious slum. I'm meeting historian Hallie Rubenhold to find out more. So we're looking about 20 streets that made up the old nickel. And within those 20 streets, there were 653 households that contained 6,000 people. That's huge. Unbelievable. A very poor family might inhabit one room. So we're looking at eight, nine people in a room of about eight by 10 feet. My goodness. I mean, what were sanitation conditions like? The sanitation was absolutely terrible. And, and this is one of the reasons why people were getting sick and mortality was, was so high. In the slum areas like the Old Nickel, the annual death rate was double the capital's average. But after 40 years under Queen Victoria, London had become the head of a global empire and was the richest and most prosperous city in the world. By the end of the 1880s, London's population had grown to over 5 million, and estimates were that a quarter of them were living in poverty. But one man, Charles Booth, a social reformer, thought this must be a gross exaggeration. One and a quarter million people couldn't possibly be living in that miserable state in the greatest city in the world. This is the heart of the British Empire, for goodness sake. So Booth set out to assess what living conditions in London were really like, street by street. He produced an astonishing series of maps. 
this is the descriptive map of London poverty. So what do the colours mean? The black is what Booth would have described as very poor, semi-criminal, and then we see we've got blue also, which is just a notch above that. Where are we here? Well, we are right here on Commercial Street. We're in red at the moment. What's red? Red is, is, is middle class, it's prosperous. So it's all down the big main roads, but as soon as you get off the main road, we've got black. Booth's maps were utterly groundbreaking in what they revealed about London in the 1880s. He discovered that in this immensely wealthy city, one third of the capital's population was living in poverty. That's nearly two million people. What's startling about this is just the degree of poverty it shows. As the shocking extent of poverty in London was exposed, public pressure increased to fix this problem. And a series of infamous events were about to shine a light on the issue and leave a lasting legacy on the city. When this map was produced, it was right in the middle of what were called the Whitechapel murders. The Whitechapel murders took place from 1888 to 1891. There were 11 murders, and five of those murders were committed by the person we've identified as Jack the Ripper. Where we are right here. Absolutely. In fact, we are drinking in the Ten Bells, which is where Mary Jane Kelly, the fifth victim, had a drink shortly before she was killed. So what was their connection to Whitechapel? Whitechapel was, you know, the, the last stop. It was where you sank at the very end of your life. And this is what happened to these women. This is why they were on the streets when they were killed. So these are women who are victims of poverty before they ever became Ripper victims? Absolutely, they were victims of poverty. Poverty is a massive problem in this city. When news of Jack the Ripper's horrific crimes hit the headlines around the empire, the pitiful state of living conditions in London's East End became obvious to everyone. Something needed to be done. And it was. From 1891, right across London, slums began to be knocked down, starting here with the Old Nickel. After decades of expansion and change, the London that emerged in 1900 was a very different city. By the end of the 19th century, London had become the most influential and the most populated city on Earth. This staggering growth had been powered by industrialization and the ingenuity of the Victorians. But in the first year of the 20th century, that chapter in the story of this city would come to an end. The 2nd of February, 1901. London was the location for a momentous event in history. The funeral of Queen Victoria, by then the country's longest reigning monarch. The procession's route through the capital was described by this newspaper as being packed and lined with the greatest multitude that any living person has seen in London. From on all sides, people poured towards the scene of the procession. The sound of wheels was silent. The streets resounded only with the tramping of feet. Queen Victoria left behind a city unrivaled in power and influence. It wasn't just the capital of Britain. It was the capital of the British Empire and of the British Commonwealth of Nations. 450 million people, a fifth of the planet's population, were ruled from here. During the 64 years of Victoria's reign, London had undergone an astonishing transformation. It had grown from a city of just over one and a half million people to a staggering six and a half million. By 1901, the capital sprawled across a huge 120 square miles. For the first time in its history, London had become the largest city in the world. It was a centre for international trade, the world's leading industrialised city. A hub of innovation, exploration, science and culture. And what Queen Victoria had started, her son, Edward VII, would continue. 
Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, was crowned Edward VII at the ripe old age of 59, and he made Buckingham Palace his main residence. As king, Edward made it his mission to modernise the monarchy, and in the process, he gave Britain's slightly grubby capital a little bit of its sparkle back. Under King Edward, a new look for the city began to emerge, built in gleaming white Portland stone. This period, from 1901 to 1914, known as the Edwardian era, is responsible for some of London's most iconic sites, Admiralty Arch, the War Office and the MI5 building. The Edwardian era saw a luxurious new capital emerge, Across the West End, theatres sprang up, like the London Palladium and the Apollo. Department stores were open for business, like Harvey Nichols and Selfridges. And for the well-heeled who wanted to spend a night in town, you could book a room at the Savoy, the Ritz, or here at the Waldorf. Opened in 1908, London's Waldorf epitomises Edwardian London. So there's no better place to meet up with an old friend, historian Dr Fern Riddell. Tell me about this rather lovely room we're sitting in. Isn't it beautiful? This is the Palm Court at the Waldorf Hotel, and I love it because it is just the most amazing example of kind of Edwardian glamour and opulence. Let's say we've gone out into the street outside the Waldorf, first decade of the 20th century. What would we have seen that maybe we hadn't seen before? You're going to see so much that you've never seen before. Motorised buses for the first time. Not only is the underground really taking off and becoming something that people use to get from where they're living to where they're working, but we're also seeing incredible advances in communication. So this is really when the telephone takes off. I mean, this is technology that is almost sci for the Edwardians. How were social attitudes changing in this period? This time is the time of the suffragettes. You know, when you went out onto the street into London here, you'd have seen crowds of women marching with placards, being run down with horses by the police. And it just is the most powerful cultural moment that I think we see in the city in its history. But the optimism, enthusiasm and glamour of Edwardian London wasn't to last. As the Edwardian era drew to a close, London found itself once again on the brink of a new age that would transform the capital. International events were about to sweep away much of what had gone before. The First World War. It brought untold misery and sacrifice to Britain and the world laying waste to vast swathes of Europe. But the story of how it affected London specifically is less well known, and it's important, because those four and a quarter years did change London. The war may not have physically altered London's geography or its boundaries, but its impact and legacy changed London for generations to come. Even in the 21st century, Londoners are still living with many of the consequences of the First World War. From the moment war was declared, at 11pm on Tuesday the 4th of August 1914, London sprang into action. There was a dramatic increase in manufacturing to satisfy the urgent need for huge numbers of munitions and weapons. Half a million rifles and bayonets, a quarter of a million machine guns, the area behind me is the Woolwich Arsenal, this 120-acre estate that's now being transformed into luxury flats was the site of the Royal Ordnance Factory, which increased its workforce from 10,000 to 75,000, all producing shells, artillery and gun carriages. As the resources of the capital were all turned towards the war effort, house building virtually ceased. Instead, new munitions factories sprung up almost overnight. In every sense, this city became the strategic command centre of the British war effort against the Germans. And because of that, London became a prime target. I'm meeting Alex Churchill, a First World War historian and author. Alex, what was the effect of the First World War on London? 
Nobody expected aerial warfare in the First World War, so the population of London are dragged into the war like never before. And then London's first hit by Zeppelin bombs in May 15. The aerial bombing of London heralded a new type of warfare, one where civilians were the prime target. They're coming into the West End, they're bombing the Strand, South London is being hit, North London is being hit, and the initial assumption that they would only hit military targets quickly goes away after the raids pick up. How shocking would it have been for people at the time to be attacked like this? I think if you want a modern analogy, you have to go with 9-11. You have to go with this utterly shocking, utterly unthought of attack. And everybody's at the theatre, people are home on leave, everyone's eating in the restaurants, having a night out, and suddenly a Zeppelin starts dropping bombs on the Strand. They probably have never seen a Zeppelin or never seen an aeroplane even, because they've, I mean, they're not even invented till 10 years before the war. So to suddenly look up and hear the buzzing and feel the bombs dropping around you would be absolutely mind-blowing. It must have felt like a science fiction nightmare. Between 1915 and 1918, London experienced the full horror of modern aerial warfare, with around 30 bombing raids on the capital. But there was one raid on an unsuspecting corner of East London which shocked the city more than any other. This memorial in Poplar commemorates the worst air raid of World War I. On the 13th of June 1917, 18 bombers come over London. 158 people are killed and more than 400 are, are wounded and it, it's carnage. One of the bombs explodes in a school and killed 18 in all children. It hit the reception class, so most of the casualties are five-year-olds. Oh They're in a grave together, and it was decided that that would be fitting anyway for them to rest together. For London, this really is a hideous moment. And um, The king and queen sent a telegram to the parents as well, who'd lost their babies in this raid. It really brings home the awfulness of war and its impact on this city when you have 18 small children dying. This deadly raid on Poplar was just one tragedy for the capital. But sadly, the war would bring many more. More than 41,000 Londoners were killed and over 200,000 were injured. Those lucky enough to return came back to a London that had changed. They found an overcrowded city of some 7 million exhausted and often undernourished souls. London's population was ill-equipped to face the next terrifying threat that was coming their way. Eleven a.m., the eleventh of November, nineteen eighteen, Armistice Day. The streets of London were packed with people celebrating the end of the First World War. It seemed like the bad times were over, but unbeknown to them. As they kissed and hugged, they were passing between them a deadly disease. At the end of the First World War, troops coming back to London from the Western Front brought with them a strain of flu that was much more virulent than usual. It was called the Spanish flu, and it was causing a global crisis. Over the course of 18 months, an estimated 50 million people died from it. That's three times as many people as have died during the course of the whole war. The flu had its most devastating effect on London's population when it struck in the late autumn of 1918. I'm meeting Carla Valentine at the Pathology Museum to find out more about its impact on the city. Why, at the end of the First World War, do we have this epidemic? At the time, I think with the most particularly virulent outbreak, it was because we were celebrating Armistice Day. And if you think about how the flu transmits, it's airborne, it's kissing and yawning and sneezing and hugging and touching with your hands. Everybody was doing a lot of that, um, and there were an awful lot of people in one place. Weakened by four and a half years of war, thousands were struck down within days. 
This one in particular caused a very extreme reaction. It stopped their lungs from working so they could be absolutely fine in the morning, catch the flu, and then by the end of the day, they were dead. It's hard to imagine the chaos that the flu pandemic would have caused. I mean, think of the comparison. Last year, in the winter, flu broke out, and we were told there was an NHS in crisis, that hospitals were struggling to find beds to cope with the 4,000 cases of flu a day. And in the end, 320 people died nationally. But in 1919, in London alone, between 16 and 23 thousand people died. For Londoners, it was the worst epidemic in living memory. So many people had been affected by the virus that there was a shortage of gravediggers, and rumours spread that London was running out of coffins. Mercifully, the outbreak came to an end in May 1919, and Londoners stoically got on with their lives. But spurred on by peace after the war to end all wars, London would undergo one of the most significant changes in its 2,000-year-old history. Over the next 20 years, London would become the largest it had ever been, thanks to a brand new concept, the suburbs. The city would double in size. But how and why did London undergo such a dramatic transformation in the two decades that followed the First World War? Well, behind me is the how. From 1919, the Metropolitan Line extension pushed London's transport links out from the centre of the capital to what was then the suburbs. And it's places like here at Wembley that the idea of suburbia first took hold. Suburbia was seen as the solution to the problem of a cramped and overcrowded London. With a population of more than seven million people, the capital had to expand. And what was needed was affordable housing. That's where the Metropolitan Line came in. The controllers of the Met owned vast tracts of land along the course of the line as it radiated out through Baker Street in central London, through places like Harrow, Pinner, Ryslip, and where we are now, in Wembley Park. So from 1919 onwards, the Metropolitan Railway used the land they owned to build a string of housing estates close to the stations with hundreds of brand new homes. What they needed was a clever way of selling them, so they came up with this, a magazine called Metroland, which sold a seductive dream of life far away from the industrialised, smoky heart of London. And if you flip through it, there are loads of adverts for beautiful homes at the edge of the countryside with every modern convenience. The houses were designed to evoke the good old days of Merry England and were built in a mock Tudor style. According to Metroland, they were situated in the health-giving air of the open country and you could pick up a three-bedroom house for just £1,125. Metroland was so successful that in just under 20 years, 800,000 people had moved to this new area of northwest London. The boundaries of the city were expanding. That pattern of rapid urbanisation was being repeated all around London, in places like Watford, Harrow and Ealing. So much so that suburbia permanently changed the shape and size of London. In the 20 years after the First World War, over three quarters of a million homes were built in outer London. Until in 1939, London's population hit its highest figure yet, a staggering 8.6 million people. The huge amount of development in the capital meant that it doubled in size and now stretched across a colossal 34 miles from Uxbridge in the west to Dartford in the east. It was an astonishing rate of growth, but it was getting out of control and had to be stopped. Now, London's councils were determined that urban sprawl shouldn't gobble up the countryside around the city. So a band of open space was introduced to stop the city expanding out any further. It was called the Greenbelt. 
The establishment of the Green Belt was a pivotal moment in London's history. It marks the point at which the boundaries of the city as we know them today were defined. But London would not thrive for long in its newly established perimeter. Another war was on the way, and it would transform the city once again, beyond all recognition. The 3rd of September 1939, the Second World War was declared. Bombing raids just over 20 years earlier had made war chiefs realize that London would again be a prime target. They feared that if the capital were destroyed, Britain would lose the war and as many as four million Londoners would be killed. Keeping them safe was critical. As the threat of bombing loomed, the government came up with something that would save the lives of thousands of Londoners. Anderson shelters. Oh, I'd look at this. I can just about stand up. But it's not very wide at all, is it? And this is for a family of six. What a squeeze it would have been. These simple corrugated metal structures were cheap to make and easy to build in backyards and gardens across the capital. And by late 1940, more than two and a quarter million Londoners had access to one. Susanna. Hello. Hello. Oh, careful. I know, I wasn't built for this. I'm meeting Blitz expert Joshua Levine to find out how these shelters protected Londoners. These Anderson shelters must have been one of the most important structures of the war. Oh, I really think they were. I mean, they're, they're really safe. They don't look it, they just look like a bit of tin stuck up in the garden. But actually, unless you were hit directly by a bomb, this would save your life. For the first year of the war, there were no bombs. But then... At eight minutes past midnight, on the 7th of September 1940, the first bomb of the Blitz dropped on the capital. Pets could hear the sirens further out. They would start, they would start wailing. Then you would hear the bombs starting to drop. So where we are now, the house destroyed over in that direction, house destroyed over in that direction, you would have shrapnel, rubble. On the first day of the Blitz alone, 2,000 Londoners were wounded or killed with thousands of buildings and homes damaged or destroyed. But it was the first of many more to come. So you had 57 consecutive nights of bombing on wow. London. And oh, well, you could imagine having to put up with that in here. Joshua is taking me to Martello Street in East London, where he has uncovered an extraordinary story of two Londoners, which helps us understand the human cost of the bombing raids on the capital. On the morning of 21st of September 1940, a high explosive bomb blew up there. There was a couple called Joseph and Ida Rodwet in number 11. They were uh, in their Anderson shelter in the garden. Right. So they weren't physically damaged. The house, however, was basically wrecked. They didn't know what to do. Ida was the sole carer of her elderly husband, Joseph, who was blind and suffering from dementia. With their home destroyed, penniless and without support from the government, she was overwhelmed. Consumed by anxiety over her and her husband's future, Ida was driven to an act of desperation. One morning, Ida got up, she walked into the room with a cleaver and she cut his throat, oh. she killed him. All she could think of to do was to actually end it for him and effectively end it for herself at the same it's time. so horrific. It's absolutely horrifying and this sort of unbelievable personal story gives you a sense of the bigger picture of what actually socially was happening at this time. Ida's fateful story is just one of thousands of tragedies caused by the Second World War bombing of the capital. These raids were meticulously documented and the records are stored here at the London Metropolitan Archives. The result is an astonishing selection of 110 maps, which reveal the extent of the damage in painstaking detail. 
What's laid out on the table here is a selection of those maps that show the city down the Thames to the East End. And what they reveal is both fascinating and terrifying in equal measure. Each individual map has been color coded by hand. The colors show the degree of damage sustained by each building. Black means total destruction. So if you look here in Southwark, London Bridge, and really startlingly so in Docklands, totally destroyed. Purple's not much better, damaged beyond repair. On one night, on the 29th of December 1940, we know that 64,000 incendiary bombs were dropped on London. And a huge swathe between St Paul's and Islington was set alight. The Second World War bombing campaign is one of the most catastrophic events in all of London's history. More than 30,000 Londoners lost their lives. The capital experienced destruction on a scale never seen before. Nearly two million homes across London were eventually damaged or destroyed. The capital was a bombed out shell of its former self. It would spend the next two decades struggling to recover. But London was not giving up and would reinvent itself once more. 1948, London lies in ruins, savaged by the ravages of war, but a new chapter in the story of London was about to begin. Immigrants from the Commonwealth arrived to help rebuild the capital, and a new, diverse city emerged from the ashes. This growing population needed more housing, but the Greenbelt meant that London could no longer expand outwards. It was forced to go up. In the next 20 years, the city's skyline would become unrecognisable. This period also heralded a massive transformation in the east of the city, on the Isle of Dogs. Throughout the story of London, from the Romans to the Tudors and into the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, the wealth and influence of our capital has utterly depended on the river that runs through its heart. And the docks have always played a crucial role. But in the 1960s, everything changed. For the first time, goods began to be transported around the world in containers. And these colossal new container ships were just too big and too heavy to negotiate the bends of the River Thames to reach the capital. It spelled disaster for the docks on the Isle of Dogs. As the docks closed one by one, the local economy completely collapsed. Between 1967 and 1981, 60% of the area that was once the jewel in the crown of Britain's trading empire became derelict. But just as it had done many times before, London picked itself up and started all over again. I'm meeting historian Leo Hollis to find out how. What you get in 1979 is Margaret Thatcher. She had a brand new vision of what the city should be. It was no longer a capital of industrialization, of industries. It was now going to be a brand new kind of city. It was an attempt to transform London from an old imperial city into a global city. This coincided with a change in how the economy worked. For centuries, the city of London had been the capital's financial center. But the international banks were outgrowing the old buildings. They needed large trading floors, and one of the places they looked almost immediately was in the Docklands. In 1981, the fortunes of this derelict corner of London were transformed when the Isle of Dogs became one of the biggest building projects in Europe, and Canary Wharf was born. Right across 97 acres here, it was a developer's free-for-all. And Londoners all around 
watched as a titanic New York-style office development emerged from out of the dust. This 235-metre, 50-storey tower at One Canada Square was the first. And right up until 2010, it was London's tallest building. Oh boy, this is high. And from up here, you can see London's new city in the east in all its glory. It is amazing. And back in the 1980s, this stretch of the Docklands was thought of as remote and inaccessible, an undesirable place even, but not anymore. 30 years after it was conceived, the rebuilding of the Docklands has completely transformed London. It pushed the city east and turned the capital into the world's leading financial centre, with a workforce set to double in size over the next 10 years. That will only be possible because of a massive £15 billion project that will generate the biggest transformation of the city since the Second World War. This is the new Liverpool Street Station. It's one of ten state-of-the-art stations and a vital hub on what will be London's newest transport link, Crossrail. It's being built to solve the same problem London faced back in the 19th century when the first tubes were built. Congestion. Last year, some 1.37 billion journeys were made by tube, but it's still not big enough. In a city that's continuing to grow, we need more tunnels. Crossrail will make it possible to transport an additional one and a half million people across the capital every day. And this is where it's all happening. The scale of this project is truly epic. 26 miles of brand new tunnels built 42 metres below London. But these miles of newly dug tunnels have given us something else an unexpected and extraordinary window on the history of London. Working on the construction site, archaeologists have uncovered evidence from Roman times that takes us all the way back to the very birth of London, when this extraordinary city was just a small Roman settlement on the banks of the River Thames. We've come a long way in our journey from Roman London, We've seen the city bitterly fought over to become the country's capital, where power-hungry kings built extraordinary buildings that still dominate the skyline today. As London grew ever bigger, it became the global capital of the British Empire, only to be rocked to its very foundations by two devastating wars. And yet, London emerged from the ashes as the monumental modern city we know today. This is the story of London. Tomorrow night at nine, split second life or death decision making as we go on duty with the emergency teams in new critical condition. Next tonight, how does a victim recover from years of abuse by a father? And how does a father become such a heinous human being? In new Fritzel the Monster, 10 years on.